menses. A word riddled with discomfort, taboos, giggles, and pain. You may know it by a different name, your period, menstruation, la regla, and the curse. But beyond its immediate stigmas, this word encompasses some of the most complex and dynamic biology of any organ system. Menses is a physiological phenomenon that is necessary to maintain and support some of the most fundamental processes in our human body, and that is the ability to reproduce and propagate the continuation of our species. Without it, we would not exist. So then why are we so afraid of this word? Universally, menses weighs heavily, particularly on the social, economic, and personal lives of people, and impacts the well-being of approximately half of the population. Sadly, due to its stigmas, this totally normal physiological process may even result in social banishment, resentment, and severe physical pain. I remember my first, my first encounter with this word. I was starting my graduate program, and my mentor, a gentleman with a charming and pronounced southern drawl, very casually said the word menses as he was describing reproductive endocrinology. And I must admit, in my mind, I giggled. Here's this male, poised, biomedical researcher talking about a topic that we wouldn't dare to speak of in other cultures. So then I thought to myself, why did I laugh? Why did I think this was a forbidden word? Why are we so afraid of menses? Our inability to even talk about it that has made menses such a scary word. So then let's talk about it. And let's talk about the endometrium, the tissue that's responsible for it, as it is one of the most fascinating tissues in the human body. And hopefully, I can convince you that we should all be studying it. The endometrium is the inner lining of the uterus and an integral component of the female reproductive tract. It's an incredibly bloody tissue that's responsible for the establishment and maintenance of pregnancy. The endometrium is also quite unique, as it is one of the, if not the only, tissue in the human body that undergoes cyclical changes of growth, differentiation, and shedding. And this occurs once a month, approximately 400 times in one's lifespan. Thus, we consider the endometrium really a paradigm for regenerative and dynamic biology. It confers regenerative properties, meaning that after it's done shedding, it can completely rebuild the inner lining of the uterus again. Through scarless wound healing, it rebuilds this complex and functional environment to enable this embryo to come in, implant, and establish pregnancy. Under the influences of estrogen and progesterone, the endometrium exerts all of this effort just to open up a tiny two to four day window where the embryo can actually implant and establish pregnancy. If implantation does occur, then hormone levels will continue, and this will induce remarkable changes in both the cellular and architectural composition of the endometrium, ultimately transforming it into the maternal side of the placenta. However, if there's no pregnancy, then hormone levels will drop, and this will induce an inflammatory cascade that will culminate in the destruction and the shedding of this tissue in a process that we know as menses. Control of such a delicate system is maintained by many different signaling factors, which include, but are not limited to, biological, cellular, molecular, immunological, biophysical, that all are targeted and controlled in a very tightly regulated manner and are expressed at specific time points throughout the menstrual cycle. As such, the endometrium is particularly sensitive to disruptions in the signaling pathways and consequently makes it highly susceptible to reproductive disorders. For example, endometriosis, a common gynecological disorder that very much like a metastatic disease manifests by being able to endometrium then grows in other parts of the body. Endometriosis is a debilitating and painful disease that manifests with other comorbidities like infertility, and it impacts approximately 10% of people with uterus. However, the true number of patients may be even higher, and this is due to the current diagnostic methods that create a delay between the accurate diagnosis and the onset of symptoms. This, coupled with the stigmas about severe menstrual pain being misconstrued as quote-unquote normal. 
We don't understand how the endometrial lining is getting to and able to survive at existing sites, but we do know it manifests in many different forms and in many different locations. In fact, we've known about endometriosis for well over 100 years, yet it remains a black box in clinical medicine and is still one of the most poorly understood gynecological disorders with limited treatment options. Those treatment options include birth control pills, lesion excision surgery, or hysterectomy. So there's a desperate need for new, better treatment options and novel therapeutics. But before we can do this, we must also first understand how the normal endometrium and menses work. And that's because, despite its importance, we still don't know some of the fundamental mechanisms that regulate regular reproductive function. For example, what are the mechanisms that regulate the normal establishment of pregnancy? How is this tissue able to fully regenerate so seamlessly across the menstrual cycle? And what are the drivers that initiate and progress the establishment of these local and systemic disorders? It becomes increasingly frustrating that whenever I talk to somebody about reproductive health, whether that's with colleagues, clinicians, or even with friends, their recurring phrases continue to be, we still do not know, it's poorly understood, or there's no treatment for that. So I ask again, how is it that we know so little about one of the, arguably one of the most important organ systems in our bodies? Well, we have to think about the history of the gynecological field. We need to think about our Greek ancestors and what they thought about the uterus. And they believed it was a living organism that crawled around and lived within our bodies, just moved around the body, creating chaos, looking for sperm. <laughs> they call this the wandering uterus. And this led to the stigmas that perpetuate and continue to influence the way we think about reproductive health and even impacts our language. We find that words like hysteria are directly rooted back to the wandering uterus and this misunderstood concepts. In fact, the word hysterectomy, which is a surgical removal of the uterus, was originally a cure for hysteria. Although we now know that the uterus is not wandering around creating chaos, sadly, these misconceptions have only served to propagate the stigmas that have hindered the advances in this field. These consequences continue to propagate even to this day at the academic level. I experienced this when I was a grad student, and I was taking a course led by a professor who was focusing on hormone signaling and breast cancer. And she mentioned that there was no cells that you could grow in a dish that would mimic and enable you to study some of these cells. And I argued that there were. We were doing that by studying the endometrium. Her response? Well, no one cares about the endometrium. There's no funding in that. So how do we begin to create change in the space of reproductive health? Well, this is going to require institutional and societal reform including providing some of those funds to support this type of research. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a slow progress in this space. It is almost as if the NIH has started to realize just now that people with a uterus make 50% of the population. Who knew, right? <laughs> but we're seeing slowly funding opportunities begin to trickle in. Issues concerning inequities in reproductive issues and, and disparities, they're becoming to be discussed. Institutions and companies and industries are entering the space, but more importantly, we're seeing the next generation of biomedical centers demonstrate strong interest in this space. This year, I was fortunate to teach a course called Frontiers in Reproductive Engineering, exclusively for first-year college students. It was a privilege, of course, to teach on this topic, but what really stood out, what was really refreshing, was to see this freshman, and I repeat, freshman, really so passionate about this topic, and begin to create creative ways to think about how engineering can help solve some of these issues. As part of their first assignment, I encouraged them to find a friend, a parent, a pet, or just themselves in the mirror and say the words menses, because understanding and creating change in the reproductive field really starts by breaking some of these taboos and normalizing these type of conversations. So what is next for the reproductive field? Well, we must first recognize that in order to try to solve, before we can even cure some of these reproductive disorders, 
we need to first understand what are the cellular and molecular mechanisms that regulate normal reproductive function. So now we must make up for decades of delayed advances in this field. And because these are such complex, dynamic tissues, we need complex tools to help us study them. So there's a need and a movement towards implementing engineering to help us understand reproductive biology. In the Laboratory of Reproductive Engineering here at Tufts, we're working to integrate multidisciplinary and translational research by merging tissue engineering and reproductive biology in order to understand the immune and endocrine mechanisms that regulate uterine health. By studying the endometrium as this paradigm for regenerative and dynamic biology, we seek to understand the physiological role that inflammation plays to maintain not just in disease, but also in normal tissue function. How do we do this? We use patient samples to begin to take some of them and clinically phenotype them, and then deconstruct these tissues and begin to separate them so we can study how these cells are communicating. Emerging technologies in advanced cell culture, physiomimetic models, and 3D imaging are providing the necessary tools in order to then reconstruct this back together and understand how the microenvironment and hormones are impacting cell communication. So now we can begin to recreate and study these diseases and tissues in three dimensions to begin to understand and dissect some of these approaches and, and functions. And for this, with these approaches, we seek to address the unmet needs for modeling, diagnostics, and treatments of reproductive diseases. Despite the growing interest in this field, it is still plagued by significant barriers to overcome. While we and others continue to work on these pressing issues, we must recognize that this is going to require interdisciplinary and institutional efforts in order to fully address the financial, the social, and the interpersonal, and in the clinical needs in this space and to close the gap on gender biology. So I hope I convince you that the endometrium is not just an incredibly bloody tissue, but a bloody incredible tissue. We should all be studying it. There is a lot of work to be done, and this is going to require significant efforts, not just from reproductive biologists, clinicians, and engineers, but also sociologists, politicians, artists, all working together to try to form and identify solutions to the needs in uterine health. This is not an easy feat. So similar to what I suggested to my students, we need to initiate change by first breaking these taboos. So I encourage you to go home tonight and say the word menses. Thank you. <laughs>